Good evening. The debate on the cost of electricity is back in the public domain after President Yoweri Museveni, in a letter to the energy minister, demanded answers on why consumers are still paying high rates for electricity. The president further asked the inspector general of government to investigate who memories alleged inflated losses and high-end user tariffs. The debate on power tariff is driven by the high cost of production in Uganda, which makes this landlocked country unattractive to investors. The electricity tariff has been on an upward trend by over 20% for the past four years, with the regulator citing depreciation of the shilling against the dollar and describing the tariff as a reflection of the economic environment. Tonight we ask, what drives the costs of electricity in Uganda on the spot night is the Managing Director Umeme, Celestino Babungi, an MP in the Natural Resources Committee of Parliament, and Rwanda North MP Thomas Tayewa, and the Executive Officer, Africa Institute for Energy Governance, Dickens Kamujisha. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. You are on the spot tonight. You know, when we are growing up, Celestino, uh, Dickens and Thomas, we knew there was only one agency which was in the electricity sector, and that was UEB. And now, these days, I've seen something I can call balkanization. You have almost five trying to handle one thing that was handled then by UEB. Let me try also to put some information here. You have one doing generation. You have another entity doing transmission. You have another entity doing regulatory. You have one doing distribution like Rare. You have Umeme. And here we find ourselves paying so much. If I may begin in the middle, Dickens, have this, have this kind of balkanization, has it given us a raw deal? Yeah, thank you very much. To understand whether this balkanization or the number of uh, institutions that are running our sector, whether they are giving us anything, is to understand actually the objective of why <coughs> Uganda Electricity Board was disbanded. Because the objective was that actually that board, because it was running vertically and horizontally, so they wanted to create specialization. That you have a company that is in charge of generation, you have a company that is in charge of uh, transmission and a company that is in charge of <coughs> distribution. As to whether those companies have actually gained that specialization and skill is another question. Because to, today, we have uh, two dams. Uh, one dam that was built in the 1950s, Owen Force Dam. Another one that was completed around 2001, the Chira Dam. That you, our Uganda Electricity Generation Company Limited cannot even run those dams. Why? Do you think we don't have engineers that we can actually train and they are able to run those dams? So it means we have not invested in that area. So the other area is that actually, what is the objective of the politicians? Because I don't think that actually our politicians are interested in ensuring that we have an effective electricity sector. And that is where we are getting it wrong. Are, are you saying lack of effectiveness is on the side of the, the end user, the, end, the, end pass, the person at the end of the chain, and that is Umeme, or at the production or transmission? No, of course, electricity is a, a technical industry. You find all those costs are interlinked. If you bring here a company to generate electricity, you go and, and uh, inflate the cost of the dam. Definitely, the, the, the company that will distribute will distribute a very expensive electricity. And that's why I would want to advise the Ugandans that it would be very, very naive for anyone to think that the President Museveni, when he was writing about Umeme's uh, bad services, that he was genuine. He's not genuine at all. And why do you say that? reason is that the President is telling us that actually in 2004, the government officials who went to negotiate inflated the, the power losses, which had already been audited by the Auditor General. He's telling us that they went and gave a return on investment that was too much. Why is it that he has not taken action on those government officials? And some of those government officials for the MPs, I think here, 
they are actually ministers. So he appointed them as ministers. They are the ones in charge. The other reason why I think that actually the president is not genuine, or whether like the companies that are, are running our biggest dams now, the one of Jagali, Singh Wanded is the one actually who brought that investor. Today is blaming other people that actually they are the ones who cause trouble. Me go, let me go to the legislature because, and, and I'm sorry if at the, at the introduction I thought you are from Rwanda, but actually from Rohinda North. Honorable mm Tayewa, -hmm. you are a member of parliament. And, and, and I suppose the reason why government was trying to bring different agencies to run the different sectors was also to get out of business then, so that you have people who have the competency and the, the skill and interest to run, to run uh, gov business like, a, like professionals. But they forgot that the first person to come, to come in was, S, was uh, uh, the South African state-owned company, ESCOM, ESCOM yeah. and which is a government enterprise, yeah. which you are handing over government enterprise to another government. Wasn't that some kind of a, of a narrow judgment on the side of government? Um, uh, thank you. I don't think it was an error. That you uh, think you your know, government has failed, another government know, is coming to run your business, um, and I think, Honorable Tayewa, that electricity is a strategic thing that perhaps even with security implication. No, uh, uh, f first get me the context in which I'm saying I don't think it was an error. I think it was deliberate. Another eating opportunity, how we usually have it here. Because when you look at how this um, thing, uh, at, at how this UEB was disbanded. Um, the lead consultant was Mr. Paul Murray from Eskimo South Africa. After this disbanding it and having these different entities, the same Paul Murray came to Uganda now as the MD of Umeme when they had given the concession to Umeme. Number two, after even this banding, most of the people reading these entities are people who are in UEB. Okay? And then also, you get the ministers. Look, uh, look at my colleagues with due respect. I, I know they are respectable, they are professional, but the ministers in charge. Okay? The ministers, most of them in charge of the power sector, were in UEB. Now, you are getting same people. Okay? putting them under different entities, and then you expect different results. If they manage to run down UEB to a stage of being defunct, okay, how do you expect them now to give you a better deal? Uh, would you be surprised? So uh, to me, I think this is an issue uh, um, that, um, that we've not handled well, but I'm really happy with the president's letter that came Though I'm not excited. You see, there is being happy. I'm happy because his eyes have opened. We have been crying in Parliament. Power tariffs, power tariffs, power tariffs. And on this one, between me and you, I don't blame Umeme. Umeme is a business. Umeme is a private company. They negotiate the best deal for themselves. That's what I would do if I was Umeme. Okay, we have, okay. We have the chief executive uh, of Umeme, right? No, no, no. Mm -hmm. wait, wait, wait a little. Mm -hmm. I would go to the one in charge in Uganda, which is Electricity Regulatory Authority, that sets the tariff, that looks after the conditions of women, and each and everything. So, so okay, let me, let me bring in Celestino here. Yeah. When you hear the cries of Ugandans who are using electricity today, and you are the one who is giving it to them, and, and, and they are paying to your company, you are, you are a managing director of Umeme. Uh, and they say, we are dying, the tariffs are so high. Are you telling them that it wasn't me? No, I think, <coughs> uh, I think I would like to compliment what my colleagues are saying. <coughs> First of all, let's step back at the time the reforms were made, around the early 2000s. One dam built in 1954 as a donation from the British government. Run down was generating around 180 megawatts. Only a quarter million customers were on the grid, right? Efficiencies, <laughs> losses were in excess of 30s, with the one collecting 80% of the bills. And UEB was dependent on the national budget. If you go into the national budget, you'll find UEB as a vote. 
I think government took the right decision to say we need to liberalize this sector to attract capital, to improve efficiencies, improve technical capability, and increase access to many Ugandans to access electricity. So what they did was put up a regulator, opened up the generation to attract private generators, maintain transmission, then also privatized the distribution to, 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 to Umeme in 2005. And again, I think sometimes we step back and say, oh, these things are all bad. You look at what have we gained from those reforms. I can say as at the moment we have more than 20 IPPs generating power. Mini hydros, solar, thermal, bujagali. Even when the Chinese Exim Bank of China was funding, it had to look at that. On the distribution side, we have one, more than 1.2 million customers. Losses have come down to 17%. Bills are being paid. And power is a bit more reliable than compared to the past. Again, you ask the question, when consumers are paying the bill, they cry to us. I think it's very important to recognize that the prices are set by the regulator. So when the regulator is setting these prices, he looks at what are the generation costs, transmission and distribution, and splits them over the available units that we are selling. Then he says, you Celestino as a domestic customer, you pay X. You as an industry, you pay Y. Right? And you find that industries are paying an average of 10 cents, Domestic customers are paying around 18 cents. And it's a balance. It's so a what do balance. you need the regulator to do for you to bring down the tariffs to a level that at least Ugandans don't have to pay through the nose? I think what has happened is uh, there are two things to the equation. Price is equal to cost over units you are selling. The good news is government is looking at the generation costs. Generation and transmission constitute around 75% of the tariff. First of all, for example, the recent discussions which I've seen in the media, I don't, I'm not privy to the deal, of restructuring of Jagali to reduce its generation cost from 13 to by an average of 3 cents. That will fall through direct to the consumers. The new generation plants coming at 5 cents compared to average generation now of 10 cents. That will fall through to the consumers. That's good from a capital structuring side. Then on our side down, what we are doing is to reduce losses because the more you reduce on the losses, the more units you have to spend. Are we over. as the customers still paying for the, 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 the Jacobson and other thermal power plants that are not even supplying power, because that is also embedded in the argument. Mm -hmm. Is it still being pushed on me? I think, come on, we have to understand this. The total generation capacity, effective generation of the country, is now at 680 megawatts. The maximum demand is at around 580. The only spinning reserve we have are those two plants. Okay? When one turbine of Jagali goes under maintenance, 50 megawatts, 10% of the general capacity is lost. What do you need? You need these thermal plants to pump in power during that and time. And how often does it have to, do you have to do to? Of course, it depends on the cycle of the maintenance. But what I know now, they are generating an average of 7 megawatts out of 50 on average per day, per month for the two plants. But we are, playing, we are paying for the 50. Yes. So, uh, Dickens. And, and, what? And, and not only paying, okay? Mm -hmm. We are giving subsidies. This year alone, this financial year alone we are in, we have paid 112 billion. For as, the as subsidies. We rejected it at parliamentary level. Okay? Finance went and paid uh, through the window of, of, of the 3% we allow as, uh, a, a, as, a, as a, um, a, I'm trying to get it, as supplementary, okay? Which we would then give retrospective approval. But look, I sympathize with my brother Celestine here. But when we are going into what causes, uh, what causes tariffs to be high, you've talked about generation costs, you have talked about uh, maintenance and all that. What about the 20% return on investment? Mm. Is it a which you are getting. That's number one. Number two, when you are getting, uh, when you are getting this concession in 2005, okay? The Auditor General had audited UEDCR and said losses were at 28%. And indeed, the first concession, by the way, was very good. Up to when it was reviewed in 2006. In 2006, they gave Umeme a ceiling of losses of up to 38%. 38%. Eight. Up from 28% that had been audited. So in short, what it means is, instead of Umeme putting the losses down, it was taking them up. And then you started declaring. In 2009, I think you declared 36% as losses yes. in 2009. Up from 2005, when you were getting the grid, 
when the losses were 28 percent. Maybe if you want to say we don't believe our auditor general, what took the losses up? And then when there was this pandemonium and all that, I think, uh, um, is it 2012 or 2009? You again brought down the losses to around 28 percent. And I, I think it's 2010. That is when we saw the first, first tariff reduce, uh, reduction from the time we got the concession. So it, it shouldn't be on about these issues uh, when we say, I know when you read error reports, error will tell you cost of the dollar, uh, cost of fuel, uh, inflation, and all that. It shouldn't be only that. We need to go deeper. What is causing this? If you can bring down the losses, it would make where, where, do, we, where, go where do we stand now? Where are the losses at? What percentage? I think, <laughs> Mr. Kamari, we can fire here. Yeah. These losses are a function of two things. And they can be audited. You look at what are you buying from the transmission, what are you, buy, are you billing to the customers, and you get the difference. I have been at the front line of fighting losses, and my staff will tell you how difficult it is to lose, reduce losses. At the moment, we're running at 16.9. It's difficult to work. I can assure you, like in Mbale area, Elgon area, our staff are being beaten, right? Losses in that area around 40%. A lot of work. We've cried for legislation. That's the area of the minister. No, no, no. I'm not pointing at the minister here. Oh, sorry. I'm just assuming that. <laughs> we've, been, for energy. we've been crying for stricter penalties from the parliament. For example, in Kenya, if you're caught stealing power, one million Kenya shillings. These are three million. They catch you in Uganda, maximum is one million or 20,000 or a prison sentence of around three years. So really, the propensity to reduce losses is a lot of hard work. And I can say getting to 16.9, when our Kenya neighbors are now at 18.4, and the last time I checked in Tanzania, they were at 21. It's a lot of hard work. And Uganda should be proud that their energy losses have gone down. World Bank reports are there to study. Our annual reports are there to study. Graduate information is there to study, which is fundamental. And I agree with Honorable Botayeba. If these losses are not come down, it has an implication on the tariff. As I told you, but the more the sales you... But if you are saying now they are 17, yeah. really, then we should be paying much, much better now. Actually, that should be the point. That, no, that should be the point. So but why, in, why not in, now? In fact, in 2009... Because from, from 38 to 17, in, in, we wouldn't be... Kamara, in 2009, losses were contributing 24% of the tariff. Now they have gone down. Okay? So, let's catch it. Yeah. What has been the impact on the time? But, uh, but I think um, I, okay, want, I want to come in here. Okay, let's have think, yeah, here. You see, like Honorable, yeah. we have really to appreciate that the biggest problem here of the electricity sector is politics. And yes, we can be here and the uh, Bremen uh, Umeme. But I can assure you, the people who went and negotiated the bad concession with Umeme, they will actually come and tell you that Umeme but has Dickens, what? But do you know that Umeme now is a Ugandan company? You see, mm. largely, if I go only by us, if I if employees who are contributing to NSSF, what, what I'm saying, you know, because the things have changed. If since. you go and uh, and get a citizenship of America, yes, you are become an American, but you are American, uh, an American of African origin. So it doesn't make me actually a Ghana company. You don't but believe I think, the, I think don't the, believe the no, investment the point, done by the point I want to make <laughs> is that. The reason why you can actually hear Umeme that it has reduced power losses from 38 to the current uh, 16%, but there is no any implication in the tariff, is the issue of our regulator. If the regulator was saying actually that, you know, one of the biggest challenges are power losses that uh, are caused by people who steal power. And for the last five years, they have been trying to amend the Electricity Act to, pu to put those punitive measures that the MD is talking about, but they have decided not to make that act. Do you believe the government actually is interested? But what we know because of the politics, I don't think this government would say, we want Ugandans to get lower tariffs, affordable tariffs. We want Ugandans actually to improve their incomes. Because when you actually increase the incomes of, the, of citizens, you actually get problems. You will never go if you're a politician to get vigilantes called crime preventers of 11 million and you are creating a reserve. When on the other side, you find you have a national debt of 15 billion dollars, how are you going to maintain the reserve of 11 million? So it tells you that all our things is about politics and the politics has crowded the kind of economic principles that we should be running. So when we sit here to discuss what is the problem with our power tariffs, it is actually about politics. 
because politics has inflated whatever we should be talking about, politics is actually now scaring away the would-be best investors. And if you scare away the, the best investors, I can assure you, you Umeme will come here and you, it will demand for the terms that they want. They will tell you they have reduced the power tariffs. They will not show you how it reflects in lowering the tariffs or increasing the tariffs. They will tell you you have connected 11 million, 11 million people, or rather 1 million people, uh, 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 1.5 million people or households, but they will not tell you how those households have actually improved. Because it is possible that actually most of those ones who connect to power today, especially in the rural communities, if you go there after six months, all of them are actually no longer what? Using what, that what power. Because, because the, the at parliamentary least we got, we got to the villages. On NRJ found out that despite the critical findings and recommendations of the Sale Committee, no forensic audit was carried out to ascertain the actual level of investment they were member limited. On the power distribution knock, there was also no audit on the return on investment to recoup by Umeme Limited through the tariff. Um, if, if a committee, I mean, if, if General Saleh is, is, is appointed by the president to do an investigation and hands over a report with recommendations, whose job is it to look into these recommendations? Because this was 209. Yes, uh, just, just before that, Patrick, on, on losses. You see, when my brother Celestino says they brought down losses, we need to ask ourselves, which losses? Yeah. We have commercial losses, we have technical losses. Yeah. In 2009, yeah. okay, uh, when your tariff was at around, when the losses were at around 36%, I think commercial losses were contributing around 17%, yeah. uh, uh, around 16% yeah. around there. And technical losses were contributing 17% yeah. in 2009, yeah. okay? Now, currently, Commercial losses contribute one percent, according to the reports I have. Yes, because uh, I go by the documents I get in Parliament, and commercial technical losses are still at seventeen percent. Okay, the same rate of two thousand and nine. So meaning you have focused on collecting money, but you have not focused on bringing the loss down in terms of technical. If the way you brought. Uh, commercial losses down. For example, commercial losses now at what? I've said one percent. You're saying <laughs> just simple. It's, it's simple. I just want to move with you. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Let's assume <coughs> I'm saying commercial losses. But he knows the figure. Why can't he tell you where they stand so I, that you can continue? Because he will interrupt my point. Okay. There's a point I was making. Okay. Let's assume commercial losses at six percent. Okay. But taking losses, we are still stuck at what we had in 2009. And yet all this has a very big impact on the tariff. I think I what think, are you getting? I think Mr. Kabala, let me clarify here. We've just the good things, the data is there. Yeah. We have all the information. We've just concluded a master study of our network, which confirms that commercial losses are six point nine percent, taken losses are ten percent. Mm -hmm. Actually, if you study the tables of maximum demand from twenty fourteen when we heavily invested in the network, maximum demand actually flattened. And we reduced significantly. Taken losses. What you are referring to as the one. Unfortunately, no audit was done to ascertain the actual level of investment that uh, you did. And this uh, is what this, the salary. And the beauty said. of it, we are a highly regulated business. Mm -hmm. Our investments plans are approved by the regulator at planning level. They are reviewed after implementation. They decide which investments they will allow in the tariff to add a rate of return, and they defer some of the you investments. Know, I'm, I'm, of I'm also quoting from the salary report who was appointed to look into this sector yeah. and said, look, you claim there's this big investment, but the regulator or whoever to, whose job it was did not do a forensic audit to ascertain how much you invested. You could yeah. deflect that. For oh, example, okay. how much have you invested since 2005? Cumulatively, I've invested more than half a billion dollars in now, this network. I have error report here, yeah. which says you have invested 405. It depends and on the point uh, at which you're looking at your uh, report. And, and, and look, this is the report of 2018. Okay. Dated when? Of 2018, uh, tariff review report for 2018. That's the 2017 okay? report. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm reading what ERA gave me. But, but sure. Okay. What uh, ERA gave me. have invested 500 oh, million. Um, um, invested in what? Uh, that would be the question. Half, half a billion yes. dollars. Um, invested in what? Um, it's a colossal sum of money. Um, not to um, have major changes. Uh, Patrick, I, I, I was that's finishing about, my that's point. That's about 1.3 trillion. I, I was finishing yeah. my point. Umeme does not report parliament. ERA does. Yeah. 
It's error that audits umeme. It says you have invested 405. Yeah. And it says in the year 2018, they are around, around $60 million yeah. worth of investment. And this is an issue we've been asking. If you are auditing, why are you talking different figures with umeme? Because if you are the one approving all investments made by umeme, why do you talk different figures? And no one can answer you. I think, Honorable Theba, let, let me clarify this. First of all, it depends on the time at which you are looking at this, because this is a going concern business and continuously make decisions on investment. Mm -hmm. And this question has been raised, half a billion. Where is it? Ask yourself, we inherited 5,000 distribution transformers. We have 12,000 distribution transformers. We inherited 16,000 kilometers of lines. We have 33 kilometers of lines. We inherited a quarter a million customers. We have 1.2 million customers. We inherited a system that was falling apart. System is now much more stable with the bigger capacity in substations, right? Losses in the system were around 38%. They are 17%. Do all those things just come by themselves? Are we still relying on the old infrastructure? What is the rationale of having the thermal plant with a capacity of about 50 megawatts and the other another 50? Uh, once in a while it gives you seven, seven megawatts yeah. and you have to pay for the whole full, for the full which is redundant what they call capacity agreements that well, what, 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 i mean what's the rationale i think you, you, I are, you, are, I, I, you are a managing director I does, that, does that make sense i can't answer on behalf of but the, does it make sense i can't answer on the behalf of the refrigerator but let's watch the space i will assure you in the next two three months mm -hmm. in tororo three cement factories are firing on the grind mm -hmm. they need 30 megawatts of power Actually, should those fire without the thermal plants and the Simba not completed, we are directly heading to load shedding. If those thermal plants were not there, we would be load shedding now. So they kick in. They are strategic. I'll give an example. In Kenya, in the last second half of the year, last year, there was a major drop. Actually, using these thermal plants, Uganda actually was supporting Western Kenya strategically yeah. to pump in thermal. These are strategic investments. Yes, yeah. you may look at them now. But that capacity, you need it. Yes, but you need it in the country. Okay, let me, let me give you a scenario. As, as a we, country, we, uh, we, Dickens, we are building a dam of, yeah. of 600 megawatts of almost to coming to 2 point something billion dollars. 2.2. 2.2 billion dollars. Yeah. To give us 600 megawatts. Yeah. The Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam yeah. on the Nile again yeah. is supposed to, to generate 6,000 um, megawatts. At 6.4 billion. At more billion. or less the same money, Six point which four. is locally... 6.4 million dollars. Yeah. Are we serious? Yeah. I think that's where we say that actually, in my opinion, we can come here and discuss power losses, discuss the agreements, but if we don't sort out the people actually who negotiate contracts for generation, we are going to get it wrong. Just ask if you, like there was a government official minister of energy here, and you ask them, how do you end up with these companies that are building uh, Simba and Karum? How did do they, uh, before you even finish a dam and they are developing cracks, everything, and you are injecting any more money? Mm. How did you negotiate those power purchase agreements? What did you negotiate in terms of the materials that are going to construct those dams? If you ask them, they would actually tell you a lot of stories. But today, they are promising that they are going to be gi giving us power from Karum at five cents US dollars. If really there was a way of how Ugandans can make an agreement with the government of Uganda, the power that will come from those dams will not be five cents. Will not even be six, will not be even seven. It will be around 10 percent, 10 cents. So at the end of the day, you see, when there is corruption from the start, it actually affects everything. And whether you bring the power losses down, whether maybe you buy the best transformers, if those ones cannot reflect in what the last consumer gets, actually people will not appreciate what you have invested. And that's why if you are today a referendum to ask which one is the worst company in Uganda today, Uganda, is, I can assure you, will say Umeme is the worst company. <laughs> when you have invested your a half, a billion, a half billion dollar, but Ugandans are saying you have the worst company, so it is up to you. And I hope that, uh, Patrick, one day you will be able to invite uh, Jacob Bissini, invite Electromax, invite Minister of Energy, invite Umeme, all these Uganda Generation Company transmission. They come like in a studio like this one to discuss. Because you cannot isolate one part of the electric sector and you think you are going to solve the problem. 
So what we need to do right now is actually to tell the politicians that yes, you have the powers, but you must allow the technical people to negotiate. But these contracts Thomas, were negotiated Thomas, by technical no, people. Thomas, what, what, what I'm saying <laughs> is that the politicians <laughs> must play the role they are supposed to play. Yes. What is that role? Yeah. Supervision. Mm -hmm. that if you are technical, you go and mess up a contract, mm -hmm. like the president is saying, actually, some people ignored all the general report mm -hmm. and the, the signed the wrong things. Okay. Gentlemen. What did you do? You are supposed to take action against that one. I, I okay. If, if you don't, we are going it is your problem. Gentlemen, we are going to take a break. But if you want to negotiate Dickens, and then everything... Dickens, we are going to take a break. When Welcome back. You're watching On The Spot. My name is Patrick Amara and my guests tonight are Honorable Thomas Tayewa, Member of Parliament representing Ruhinda North, uh, Mr. Celestine Babungi, who is the Managing Director of Umeme, and Mr. Dickens Kamujisha from Africa Institute for Energy Governance. And we're discussing the cost of electricity in Uganda. Gentlemen, I know for a fact that in the next one year or two years, we'll be having Simba and maybe Karuma on the grid. And Karuma is supposed to produce 600 megawatts and maybe mm -hmm. Simba 180, right? Yep. Yeah, 180 and, and now, at the moment, we still have uh, some kind of su surplus mm -hmm. because I hear of a surplus. Mm -hmm. So I'm imagining if in two years you put almost 800 megawatts with, with I'm sure in the power purchases agreement, there's an embedded in agreement that you have even to pay for the power that is generated even though you're not using it. Mm -hmm. That you, is, actually, you have to that consume that power and pay for it. Is it, isn't it, isn't it, isn't it, isn't it not unfair that we're going to have 800 megawatts mm. and I don't think we're going to have many industries consuming that power that are going to spring up so fast. So we'll be paying for the power that is not being in use. You, you, you see, uh, how, how, as members of parliament, how are you going to s solve that? You see, Patrick, National Development uh, Plan 2. Um, the target for 2018-2019 for uh, the cost of power of electricity was 7 cents, US cents, okay? That is for 2018-2019. But now, as we talk, it's still above 11 US cents. Now, when you read the World Bank reports, the, the ratio of, uh, of GDP growth to electricity should be 1% to 4%, meaning every 1% growth in the GDP you get, you should increase your electricity by 4%. Now, for Uganda, <laughs> for, for Uganda, whereby uh, we have around 6% GDP growth, okay? And then you look at our electricity penetration because uh, now at peak, the demand is around 570 megawatts. It means we are at around 1%. For 60% GDP growth, the ratio is 1%. That clearly tells you where the problem is. Now, the question you're asking is very clear. We sign capacity agreements. This is a trend internationally. It, it's not only for Uganda. Capacity agreements, that's the trend. Because the investments are very, very high. But when you produce what you cannot consume, because when you're looking at electricity, there are two things. There is availability and affordability. Okay? If you have power available, but people can't afford it, that's constrained demand. I'm looking at a service, I cannot afford it. What will it help me? So you're going to bring Isimba, 183 megawatts. You're going to bring uh, Karuma, 600 megawatts. You're going to bring mini hydros. I think on average, Celestine, we might be bringing around 1,200 megawatts. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Onto the grid. What have you done? Okay? Because you must pay for this power. What have you done to sell this power? So nothing. So, uh, so, 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 so uh, but I'm, I'm just coming. Celestin. I'm just coming. Yes. What do you need? What you need is very simple. You need industries. In the next few years, we are going, each year, we are going to be connecting around 300,000 uh, 300, homesteads. They will be consuming 10 to 15 megawatts. Usukuru factory in Tororo alone at full operation 
will need 200 megawatts. When it opens, it needs 60 megawatts. And comparison here, and uh, I had gone to Celestine sometime back to Kwaru. Comparison, it uses around 50 megawatts of power. Now, of the 50 megawatts, it gets 36 hours of road shedding per week. And we have surplus. So that's why we are saying umemi. Well, I mean, wait yeah. a minute there. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, with this kind of surplus, so we yeah. don't have a surplus. If you have a major production unit within Kampala and it's being load shedded, 36 hours, would ask we why. visited it. Why yeah, Celestine? I, I, think, I think, let's go back to the context of the, of the whole debate. On the, co on, the, on, on the surplus, which we are talking about, the 800 plus megawatts coming on the stream. Mm -hmm. I think government is doing the right thing. You are better off having a surplus and you chase, demand chasing surplus, than the other way around when you have demand, like the situation we are in in the late. In the oh. Kundu, do we nights. have negotiated oh, no. that argument in a way that we do not have to pay for redundant no. power? No, M my no. brother. The power that's not being no. used. No, I think I will not that's go into the negotiations <laughs> on take or pay or whatever arguments are agreed upon. But it's for me, I see it as, as an opportunity for the country. Because you seem to suggest that I am better off having it, paying for it even when it is not. No, no. no. What is saying, what Celestine, what you are saying is that's a very dangerous statement. You. Currently, the country produces at around uh, around 750 megawatts. You're going to add on around 1,200 megawatts. You're not doing anything to distribute this power. What does it mean? We Ugandans who are currently suffering, paying for extra power, which is around 750 megawatts, you're going to add on us no, 1,200 megawatts. So what the government needs to do, okay? it must ensure this power is utilized. When you're saying that demand should just, uh, uh, should surplus. just surplus. Yeah? Now, I, I don't get it. What kind of demand? I the think demand is very low. And, and surplus is very high. And I think, on, on they belief, must that, move that's why together. I want to clarify this. Okay. Thing, yeah. okay, so, so this is a fundamental structural economic issue. Yeah. If the current available supply of electricity, 70% goes to industry. Mm -hmm. Therefore, if you bring on 1,000 megawatts, you must build your industrial base to evacuate this power, consume this power. Because when you have industry and the cottage usage of electricity, you put money in people's pocket through employment. That's the desirable. But what is the actual? actual. Yeah. And, 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 and actually, what do I see as an MD of Umeme when I move around? A lot of industries are setting up in Namanve. You go to Tororo, you have three cement factories setting up, drive around Bombo Road. Go to Kapeka, there's an industrial park. Recently, the industrial has, has been an industrial park for 20 years. No, actually, but, but, but <laughs> actually, if I want, you see the number on the right industry. now, the, the, the government was actually taking away back the land exactly. from the, from the so-called investors. But I think I wanted the, to add on what uh, Honorable was saying. You see, in 2015, the World Bank uh, was auditing the investments in Uganda. Mm -hmm. They said that actually, where we invest a dollar, mm -hmm. actually, we end up getting, if we are lucky, Half a dollar, sometimes less than a dollar. Mm -hmm. They were saying, how much do we lose in corruption? Almost like 500 billion in corruption. And where is that corruption? So the issue of saying, actually, we need to generate more power today than waiting until the, there is uh, actually scarcity, I can understand it. But if your pro investments are inflated because of the corruption that we are talking about, it is going to be very, very difficult for you to have even the consumers to consume that power. Mm -hmm. And that's why even the, the, the investments that you are talking about, the industries, I'm very sure they are going, if you are, you are, you are you, 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 right now actually the cement, you, if you go to most of the towns, they don't have the cement. Why? But they are not even going to consume that power. Kenya, yeah. which we are all proud of, in far as the manufacturing sector is concerned, manufacturers consume 900 megawatts in Kenya. You're bringing 1,200 megawatts on the grid. It's very, very simple. But Umeme, what you need to do is rest. Okay? And uh, what some of us but uh, he, he, are reading. Well, his mandate is only to sell to where there's a demand. No, but in but Uganda, what happens? When you're going, uh, when you're seeing adverts for land, you see uh, we have power and electricity. Okay? So meaning uh, power electricity usually they chase they chase development. 
but development should be chasing power and electricity. And, and, and okay, no, so, but I, I, so, should, I should step back uh, here and, uh, okay. and take charge of there, this. There's, there's, <laughs> when, there's when, gentlemen, we say that we have surplus, we forget the fact that only about 20%, 23% or 23% of yeah. Ugandans have yeah. power. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. have almost 80% yeah. in darkness. Yeah. What supplies are we talking about? And I, I think that's why we have to, <coughs> to have a debate on these matters. Mm. If you see like countries like Kenya, mm. in terms of their household location, they live in the communities and urban centers. And in Uganda, we are sparsely populated. So th government is doing the right thing through the rural education agency to extend lines to rural areas. But even if you extend lines to rural areas, they will not consume all this power. I still affirm that industrial growth, cottages, usage of power, will drive this economy forward. But also we should not forget that the oil is coming. It's going to suck up power and all the related activities along with the pipeline, the refinery. So I think it's a good thing to, gener to invest in these generation plants, yes, but very soon we'll see the benefits of that investment. By, by the way, I think for information, yeah. right now, Sinok yeah. has a, is applying to air to be allowed to build the gas power plant in, yes. the, in the Changwari to yeah. generate 39 megawatts. Yes. So when you say oil is going to consume that power. They, they, they are actually power looking at generating their own power. And actually in the application, they are saying they want to sell excess power from the gas power plant to the grid. So actually they are going to be giving you more power. Or sugar but, factories. But, but I think for me, their they, but they are also capacity. using their bio, 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 But they are gas. even, in, like, I think Kachira has now gone to 60, yeah. 60 yes. megawatts, yes. which was approved but, for 2018. But, but, but so I, who I, is, every factory wants I, to buy I, its I, own power to produce its own power. I think especially, uh, Thomas, yeah. the point of the governance in the management of our investments. Sometimes you can come here even as an MP. You are also crying like even us as ordinary citizens. I don't know what is the role of parliament. Mm -hmm. To ensure that actually you have your oversight powers, you have legislative powers. Mm -hmm. What do you do? Mm -hmm. If, for example, the World Bank tells you that actually everywhere we are investing, we are not getting any return. What does that one mean? What is, should be the role of a, a parliament? If right now the Bank of Uganda has told us that actually we have a debt of 15.1 billion. That is around 58% of our GDP. Mm -hmm. And they are also telling us that actually that is not sustainable. They are telling us that actually I think in the financial year 2018, 20, 2017, 2018, that of the 14 trillion that is supposed to be collected by URA, we are supposed to use 9 trillion, 9.9 .9 trillion to service the debt. So what remains for Ugandans to transact here to be able to build their capacity to set up industries and consume this power? Because it tell, this country right now is in a crisis. But when it is in a crisis, institutions that are supposed to take responsibility to ensure that when we borrow this money, when we bring at what, at what in, okay. when we bring here an investor, we get maximum benefits. But if we he bring here an investor, you sign agreements that are not accurate. You bring here an investor, you start constructing Karuma, you Simba. The other time, uh, electricity generation transmission company Limited was saying, we are about to get that power. They were saying, ah, oh, they have failed to get even a land where to build transmission lines. Just imagine that you start building a dam. Three years down the road, you even don't have where to build the you transmission to lines evacuate. to evacuate the power. Me, I would be looking at the parliament. Because the parliament is the one that has capacity to actually supervise those ministers and even the president. I, I, if I, if, I if they I don't do that, we can be here and actually... But the, and the parliament, the parliament I remember around 2009, yes. even came out with a recommendation. Was it 2009? No, no. Much recent. <laughs> that, that, that terminate the whole contract. Even yes. though that would, could not be possible because the government was, would have lost a lot of money. No, no, no. no. By the way, for me, I think, Thomas, before you come in, what is very, very important, assuming we sit here and we agree as a country that the contract with Umeme is a bad contract. That every passing day Umeme is here. We, we lose much more than if we terminated its contract. You actually sit here and say, I have terminated the what? The contract. And but pay, but, and, and but pay assu pay. assuming now you, you terminated the contract of Umeme, but in Karuma, you don't have a good deal. In Simba, there is no guarantee that you have a, a, good, a better deal. In Bujagari, you are crying that you are borrowing money to buy down the tariff. Jacobus uh, Electromax, actually they are giving you nothing. 
are you sure that you are not going to get even a worse company than what? Now, this, than is, uh, women? this, so this is what I, I was I, coming to. I okay, okay. This okay. Is one at a time, gentlemen. Yeah. Yeah. Let's yeah. let Celestine go first. Let me say something. I think we must elevate the debate. Mm. Mm. And for me, what I've learned from Umeme, I've been the CFO, we went for the listing of the company, we went on international road shows. The fundamental thing is, as Uganda, we are underselling ourselves. How do we raise the platform of Uganda to attract FDI, which can transform this country? We can talk here. The other time, Mr. Moiro at, at Standings indicated that if all the banks pulled capital, the maximum they can raise in this country for one big project is $200 million. We must elevate the country, sell it internationally, attract the right investors to drive industrialization. They will consume this power. But as long as we keep not looking at the power as the problem, instead of looking at how do we take opportunity of this power to attract more people, to create jobs, to transform our raw materials, mm -hmm. then we'll continue running around the 500 megawatts instead of raising the bar to 2,000 megawatts as the president <laughs> has indicated plus. And we have a lot of opportunities geopolitically, Congo, South Sudan, Rwanda. You, you remember 2016 when there was a crisis in have South Sudan? Have you seen the movement of people from Congo to Uganda <laughs> yeah, as uh, uh, biblical proportion no, uh, migrating? And you see that, that, but, but, but even the power you want to export, Celestine. Yeah. No. Ethiopia is building a 2,000 me megawatt. No, 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 no. Mm. A 2,000 megawatt power line. Okay? Yeah. Bringing power to the East African power pool. Now, what now if, if Ethiopia is going to bring very cheap power into the East African power pool, who are you going to sell your expensive power? When you start telling me about opportunities in Congo and all that. No. Now, you, in 2000, and, uh, I think it was 2005, your CEO... Anton Eban, of uh, I, I think it's uh, it's um, it, it's a Grobeck uh, uh, during the World Bank Energy Week in London. He made a very very good statement for Umeme because he was making a presentation. I was reading it. Good fences make good neighbors. Where he said, "Oh, we've got a sweet deal in Uganda." That's what he said. It's in his report. We've got a very sweet deal in Uganda. Then we managed to even sweeten it much better in 2006 by reducing the power of the regulator, giving you more leverage, by raising, uh, by, by, by get, raising the threshold for taking for, for losses from 24 percent to 38 percent. But but, by, but, by but, doing but you all know now. Things. But you know now that I, the, the Ugandan money has been injected into Umeme now. It's no longer a foreign. I can say something here. What I was saying is when there was a crisis in South Sudan in 2016, mm -hmm. what we saw is directly our large consumers in steel, cement, FMGCs, mm -hmm. their consumption of power reduced mm -hmm. because their markets yeah, were affected. Yeah. Therefore, if we reverse Uganda geopolitically to attract industries to export, not exporting electricity, we take advantage of our proximity to our neighbors, we manufacture and export, create jobs here, use this power here. I think we'll benefit more. Fundamentally, we must sell Uganda to the international community as the best destination for capital. If we continue making noise, if around the economy, if we, there is lack of respect for contracts, if there are issues around the macroeconomics of the country, Capital is shy. Capital doesn't like noise. Capital likes stability, certainty. Capital will flow. It may migrate from here to another destination. And it's incumbent on us as Ugandans in different sectors, in different roles, to make Uganda attractive to attract capital. The, the other day you met the president. Respect Africa. the contracts, even the, the, when the, the contracts are not bad. No, a, 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 a bad the contract. other day Celestine and his team met the president after he had written the letter. Did you tell him more that? What the I way you're telling is, it to us here. What I can say is the letter, <laughs> we are not privy to the letter, therefore I can't comment on it. Uh, uh, and also I'm not able to the comment, statement. You comment, to comment you on our engagement you, you, with the president. You, no, you released the statement yeah. about that letter. That then you're saying you are not privy. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, of course you are, very you are not privy when you release but, the but, statement. But, but no, okay. at the same time, I, <laughs> me, I agree with Celestino yeah. that actually we must make sure the image of Uganda is good enough to attract the best investors to attract the best capital. And that's why, like, uh, as we have an MP here, what is it that actually parliament can do to make the image of Uganda good enough? 
what is it that judiciary needs to do to make the image of Uganda good enough? What is it that the executive should do to make Uganda good enough? R because right now, you can say you have soldiers go and attack parliament. To have a law and it is, it is captured worldwide. The next day, you have soldiers go and attack the high court of Uganda. Captured everywhere. <laughs> The next day, a president of Uganda is uh, writing, saying, ah, the biggest dispute of power in Uganda, he's actually, the assumption is that actually he's cheating Uganda, because he's saying mysterious uh, investments of 500 million, uh, million US dollars, he's talking of mysterious returns on investment, he's talking of mysterious of 38% uh, of power losses. What is he telling the investors out there? That here we are stable. That our risk profile is high. But no, okay. we, who, 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 has the, who has the powers in, and who has the responsibility to ensure that actually such things don't happen in Uganda? I think unfortunately here is that institutions have been reduced to almost nothing. And as long as our institutions are not playing the roles that they are supposed to play, we can come here and make noise about to meme. Even a new company that will come in will even no, be in, worse okay. than meme. Welcome back. You're watching On The Spot. My name is Patrick Amara. My guests tonight are Honorable Thomas Tayewa, Mr. Dickens Kamujisha, and Mr. Celestine Bagunji. We are discussing the electric power uh, tariffs that are so high for Ugandans. One other problem I've, I've had, Celestine, is that even the prepaid meters are faulty. People are crying with them. And I'm wondering who allows these meters to be distributed, to be sold to people, and yet they are faulty and they are cheating them. Have you had something like that? I think let me f make this clarification here uh, regarding our meters. Our meter suppliers are international certified suppliers. Even when we are you have not heard about the cry of the meters. I've heard about it, but I'm making a clarification. Here. Okay, they go through a lot of factor acceptance testing. They go through pre-shipment testing before they come into the country. When they come in, also we have a lab which tests. And again, through the recent instruments of UNBS, they're even testing. We're putting out sample meters there. They test them before we deploy them on, uh, in the field. We do, not, we do not import any fake meters. Our suppliers are very, very, very reliable suppliers who have supplied these meters over the period. Is there a report by UNBS saying uh, your meters are faulty? We have a report mm -hmm. which from UNBS certifying each of the meter uh, categories and even every import we bring in now, they test samples. And we have not seen any rejection of any batch we have of the meters. A, we have a report in Parliament, which yeah. we got. Yeah. UNBS yeah. is saying some of the meters you bring are faulty. No, they are not. And, and uh, uh, Celestine, if you could listen to your clients, okay? You do have clients who say, I buy yaka of 10,000. The tariff is set for a certain period, but today I get this much kilowatts. The next day I get different kilowatts for the same amount. Many, many Ugandans. And I, I, I don't know what causes it. But uh, what, what I know, for example, not, it, some of the meters are not actually from Umeme, right? Because there are other suppliers. For example, where I come from in Kenjojo, you are not the one no, who's selling. No, you're not the one who's selling. Yeah. It's not Umeme. It's not in Kampara. In Kampara. Yeah. In Kampara. Mm -hmm. And he knows. And you've uh, seen such a complaint. Let me, you've had that complaint. And yeah. actually, we raise it with the regulator. Mm -hmm. And I can say to our consumers, it's the result of the tariff structure. The tariff structure is set in such a way that, A, you pay a fixed charge of 3,360 per month. B, you are entitled to a lifeline tariff for the first 15 units you consume in a month, they are priced at 150 shillings. Mm -hmm. C, above 150 shillings, above 15 units, you pay the applicable tariff, which is around uh, just under 700 shillings. Mm -hmm. Now, when a consumer comes in at the beginning of the month, he pays the fixed charge and takes advantage of the lower priced initial units. So you will get so many kilowatt hours. Mm -hmm. If Should you pay you, on the first day of the month. Yeah, within the first day of the month. If you come back to buy the same units, Assuming you have completed your first 15 in the month and you're coming to buy again the first 15 uh, in, the, in the same 30 days, you'll buy those units at a, the higher rate. So you're likely you are likely to get 
fewer units. And why is it why? configured that and, way? And, and, and why, why is it why? configured why? that way? It's a regulatory matter. We've read the matter to the regulator saying we should adopt a flat tariff structure which gives certainty. So that if a mm -hmm. tariff unit is at 500, that's it. I bring 10,000, I get 10 units, that's it fixed. And I know our regulator is working around it to, to change the tariff structure to ensure that there is certainty and clear explanation of these variations. But I think like the point about the 40 meters. You know, a year ago in 2010, we filed a case in the High Court. And it was about the, the actually the weaknesses of Umeme and the, the regulator. Of course, our courts, the judiciary system, the <laughs> complete, decided not even to hear that case. <laughs> actually, one, of the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, one day when we went there, Umeme came with uh, around nine lawyers from all these big farms, <laughs> and the judge actually started blaming us. Why have you dragged all these people to court? <laughs> Before even listening to what? To our case. But if you ask the question to Celestino, do you have 40 meters? You expect them to say that actually we have 40 meters? If you ask the Uganda Bureau of Standards, do you have capacity actually to test the, the meters of Umeme? <coughs> I can assure you, they don't have that capacity. Even when we filed that case, they were telling us that actually we don't have capacity. Okay. We asked actually let me, let, let us, and the let, let us, have let us the involve Ugandans who have been uh, watching this program from all over the country. And I think something new has been happening in the villages. In fact, they saw over the Christmas that they are no longer on the grid. Ugandans have bought their solar. They, are, they are, have their lights. They are watching TV and listening to music thanks to the solar energy that is, they have. And it, the, the, the prices are falling down and the technology, technology is increasing. But what are they saying tonight? So let me take the very first caller online. And they have a caller. Hello. Hello, Mr. Kamara. Good evening, sir. What's your name and where are you calling from? My name is Ismam, calling from Entebbe. This man in Entebbe, your name, sir? Um, Celestino has the right to argue the way he's arguing mm -hmm. because that is his job. Okay? Okay. Uh, I wonder how we can talk about expanding power to the foreigners when the local consumers are actually having problems. Could you explain that? And, you, you see, he's here arguing that we could look at the South Sudanese consuming because the companies are getting a lot of money. But I'm using Yaka. And the biggest problem is that variation in payments. You get fewer units at a certain time, you get more units at another time, and is there the MD um, confusing people, I should say, because he's trying to defend what cannot be defended. Okay. Uh, uh, Celestine, be patriotic. Thank you, sir. And Celestine is going to respond to you uh, after um, a couple of minutes. I'm trying to have maybe two or three more people uh, make their submissions tonight. I have another call online. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. How are you? Uh, uh, whoever's online, you have left your TV set on and uh, the, the volume is high, so it is creating an echo. We can't have an, a health conversation unless you turn down the volume of the TV. Hello? Hello? Yes, good evening. Good evening. What's your name, sir, and where are you calling from? This is a Bosco Katene. I'm sorry? Bosco Katene. Bosco, you're on air. Yes. What's the honor? Yeah, I understand. A lot of irrational sight. Unfortunately, Bosco, I have a problem hearing what you're saying. Um, either the network is poor where you are, or Maine has a, a challenge right now. So I'll have to try another line. Hello. Hello, good evening. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Yes. Uh huh. What's your name and where are you calling from? I'm, I'm calling from Kireka. From Kireka, what's your name, sir? I'm called Oguari Tom. Oguari Tom, you're on air. Yes. In mm -hmm. fact, Umeme is a total problem. The last time I went, I, I went to there to apply for power. When I applied for power, they brought the meter, which was reading, 10 units. 
After 10 units, then they charged me money for 30 units. I went on complaining up right now. They have never verified. So they have broke the, the meters, which are, which are reading 10 units, and they are charging 30 units. What is bringing that? Okay, uh, Tom. Uh, and secondly, yes, sir. when you apply <clears throat> in the time, I have a case right now on, on my, my table. We applied on January, on, on January 8th. Up to right now, March, it is ending now, March. They have never connected me. I don't know why. Okay, the, we have the MD here, so you can he respond to that. Uh, let me take the last two callers online and then uh, my guests will uh -huh. respond to them. Hello. Good evening. Good evening, sir. What's your name and where are you calling from? My name is Ronald. Yes, Ronald. I'm calling from Masanafu. Masanafu, you're on air, Ronald. Yeah, indeed, they have, they have a problem. And what is that from your point of view? Now, the problem is the, the tariffs. If you had to check, I'm just from paying power now. I just paid 5,000, but they have just given me five units. Five units. Last time, Nansen, I used also to pay some money, but the variation is too much. Mm -hmm. So they have to work on their tariffs because we are suffering seriously. They are favoring the people in the village only. All right. Thank you very much. But the really, you, they are only supplying to 20% of Uganda's population, and I suppose those are urban centers. The villages are in darkness. For those who can, are using solar. Uh, the last call online. Hello? Hello. Good evening, sir. What's your name and where are you calling from? My name is Batambwe Johnson. I'm calling from Kamuli. Batambwe in Kamuli, you're on air, sir. Yeah, I'm very happy to see those guys of Umeme on, 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 on TV. Mm -hmm. I want to inform them that in Kamoli, we hardly have power in a day. There has been no power in Muyenga, which is so close here to Kampala for the last two days. <laughs> yeah, so. in, in Kamoli, the power goes off about 30 times a day. <laughs> okay. So you okay. have to run to their office. You I'm have sorry, to call sir. Them. You have to do whatever to see that you push on a day to, to do something. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I can I understand my producer is telling me quite a number of you would want to be a part of this discussion. Unfortunately, we cannot keep taking all the calls, but I respect that you had. Uh, issues to rise and uh, probably you'll find a way how we can, they can come here. And if they have asked your question, maybe it will, they will have represented you in some way. So let's go for them. Yeah, uh, thank you, Kamara. I really appreciate the feedback uh, from our customers. Um, I'll start with Isma and Entebbe. What I was referring to is uh, uh, not exporting power, but setting up industries in Uganda, for example, <laughs> on cement, fast-moving, for, uh, food processing, then we export those goods resulting from the processing systems in Uganda to the neighboring uh, to the neighboring markets. I'm not advocating for, though it can be a potential possibility of exporting power for which we don't have a mandate as Umeme, and what I'm advocating for is industrial setup in Uganda and those industries take advantage of the neighboring market to sell, uh, to sell their goods while creating jobs for Ugandans while using electricity within Uganda. I also take note uh, from, again, Isma, I thank you, Tom, uh, Nikileka, and, uh, and, and Ronald. Uh, the issue of variation of uh, units, depending on when you purchase, we take this matter extremely seriously. And I'm on behalf of the consumers as a frontline person, I'm going to advocate with the regulator to ensure that we come to a flat unit rate uh, for, for electricity, which is predictable, because the current tariff regime is so complex for our consumers, and if they don't understand it, it causes a lot of confusion as if we are perceived to be cheating or not transparent. Uh, we'll bring this matter to the attention of the regulator to come up to a, a, long, a, lo a long solution. To it. it has been on for some time. And uh, Tom and Kireka, apologies for the long delays in service. I will pick up this matter. Um, I'll look out for your contact here before I leave to ensure that I can investigate this, this lag in, uh, in service delivery, which you have highlighted in your area. In Kamuli, I'll look at the, I'll also look into this matter to find out why uh, there is You have not had any report about that. 
I've not, it has not come to my attention, actually. Kamuli has not come to my attention. 30 times. Yeah, 30 times. <laughs> I would be surprised. But I will look at it seriously because our ambition really is to provide reliable, continuous supply because that's the job we are paid to do to our consumers. And for me, personally, when our power goes off, I feel sad because I know that's production lost. That's a child not reading his books. That's a risk in health facilities. That's ICT not working. I feel sad. And I take it personal whenever there's no electricity uh, uh, and, in and, any area. And that's where our concern is. Wherever the ro there is road shedding, uh, Patrick, whenever there is road shedding and we are not consuming power, okay, it means we are paying for, pr for free power. So that's why we are saying, Umeme, invest in, taking co in, in ensuring you reduce the technical losses. Yeah. And uh, ERA did a report, and it found that for every increase in power tariff, of 1%, it, it creates a decrease in demand for power by 2.7%. And for every decrease in the power tariff by 1%, it creates a demand for power by 2.7%. And, and now, wh what does this mean? Okay, We must sit down, because there is a report of 2012 by PB Power, South African company, uh, which was commissioned by ERA. It clearly put it that the problem with taking corrosives is the investment you need to make. In fact, it recommended investing around $400 million. And I, I, I would want to know, uh, I would want to know, is it because Umeme doesn't have capacity to invest? Because if we do invest, uh, uh, Patrick, when you see the low voltage lines between transformers, okay. the longer the distance, the more the technical losses you'll be getting. The more the power losses, you'll be getting. So meaning we need to revamp the grids. We need to inject more money. And that's why I'm saying, Umeme, you don't have this capacity now. Let us go to UEDCR. <coughs> we come, we raise money. I was looking at the figures when UEDCR was in charge. In 1999, when, UEB, uh, when there was UEB, we had 163 to uh, 295 customers. When it was disbanded, UEDCL added 20,394 customers without any funding, like the one Umemi has. By 2004, eh, the number had increased to 240,000. Okay? And what if they had the borrowing of Umemi? What if they had the privileges we have given Umemi? And I have this Celestine. He's a very good CEO. And I've been telling him, Celestine, all these good things you're doing for this case of Umemi. Let us take you to UED cell. We build the capacity okay, no, of okay, the local okay, company. Let's, let's and and, and we do it very well. As we're finally, so finally on that issue, on that issue. I, I go back to the issue of the return on investment. When we were getting ESCOM, okay, to run Narubari Dam and in 2004, we gave it a return on investment of 12%. In 2005, when we were getting Umeme, we gave it a return on investment of 20%. But, but I think for okay? me, okay. I, I, I think so all these this were Dickens. deals. Yeah. People were just Thomas, making I deals. Think, uh, let's bring in Dickens. There is something that we, as we, maybe the time is uh, ending, yeah. we, we need to look at. Mm -hmm. What should be done? Yeah. Yeah. Do we continue crying and doing what? I know for sure. Umeme has its own weaknesses. <laughs> Even if Umeme was to go out of Uganda today, you will remain Address ninety percent of the problems with what uh, will remain. We remain. I agree so with you. What do we need to do? Yeah. I, uh, I think the problem is largely not Umemes, in my view. I know they contribute to the part of it. Umeme is smart but, in business. But I think the biggest yeah, part yeah, is us as a government, mm -hmm. is us as leaders. One thing, for example, mm -hmm. we are doing Yaka right now. When we had the postpaid meters. There were some, like at your house, you would actually look at that meter. When they brought to postpaid meters, Umeme decided to put them up there. That actually you cannot actually look at that meter. If this is my meter and I'm supposed to be able to see what happens at that meter, mm -hmm. why would the error actually allow Umeme to put that meter there? So if they are giving us 40 meters, who should be blamed? Umeme? But, 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 as a but taking away as, as far as, but, 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 I have a small question. As I'm concerned, Yaka has been a game changer. I, I, no, I, I, game I, 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 I have a small question for you, Patrick. Very small one. Mm -hmm. Who is in charge of the electricity sector in Uganda in terms of ministries? 
I, I'm asking Patrick. The Honorable Minister from the East. No, no, no. Get it from me, it's a no. Actually, all, 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 all agencies for main agencies in charge of electricity. Electricity regulatory authority. So you mean engineer? Uh, uh, listen, it? listen to me. Electricity regulatory authority is under Ministry of Finance. Uganda Electricity Generation Company is under Ministry of Finance. Uganda Electricity Transmission is under Ministry of Finance. These are the main companies. UED cell is under Ministry of Finance. These are the companies in charge of the electricity. And I'm wondering sector. the technical competence of finance, in finance into the energy. In finance, who has the technical capacity to supervise these agencies? Cabinet has passed several resolutions. Take them away to energy. People have said no. Okay, but but I, I think it is strong. But because we have to leave this place, mm -hmm. I think helping Ugandans to understand. Okay, okay. what we, we, if you have Can like parliament? And they know that actually these institutions and the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of Finance has no competence. What happens? Are you saying the parliament you have no capacity? You cannot you, because you are elected. You, you, you can't come you back and organize with us. You are elected by Uganda. Patrick, yes. but we are working on something. You are one of the member of parliament. No, 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 no. for Uganda. Uh, next week, you can't just come and uh, cry uh, with uh, us. Patrick, Patrick, as we, as we, as next week, something is coming on. But first, as we leave this studio. We need, to look, what I we need to, live, uh, to look at the things. I tell you, ERA is not in charge of electricity in real terms. If you look at all the power purchase agreements we sign with these companies that are building dams, they don't play any single role. And if we s sign the wrong purchase agreements, like these dams of Karuma and Simba that we are signing, uh, that we are, we are building right now, definitely whether if you give that power that is from very expensive dams to Memi, well, maybe we'll give you. Okay. Our, our, time, our time is out, uh, but I, I'm, I'll ask you to just one more question, and then each one of you will make your concluding remarks. Uh, do you th really think that your own staff of Umeme are using Umeme, for example, for cooking? <laughs> or okay. they are also just like the most of us <laughs> who are using biofuel and charcoal? I think I, I can't talk Which general. is detrimental oh, to oh, the oh, environment. They have I, can, free I can't talk general on behalf of my staff because <laughs> I don't look behind <laughs> what I, they use. Because I'm uh, thinking maybe you have the <laughs> electricity. Have uh, uh, okay, I'm sorry. I didn't want to sing out your yeah. staff. I yeah. want to tell the reality that the majority of Uganda, including perhaps we may find honorable members, ministers and MPs, are actually not even using power for cooking. And, 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 and for me, that's a worry because for every Ugandan who has had dinner tonight, almost 95%, that dinner must have been prepared using biofuel or charcoal. Actually, and at least charcoal or wood, gas, yeah. at least those are the things most in Uganda here. But you, then in the but villages, eventually, almost 100%. I was, I was in Ingoma, I was in Ingoma last week, and the areas of, uh, of Northeast, the biggest business they're doing is charcoal. Yeah. So our forest cover is totally gone. As a country, we are facing an existential threat. And, and I think uh, you answer that and you give us your part. Yeah, I think that's very important, Patrick. Uh, in terms of, as I indicated to you, it's a combination of several inputs to the end user tariff that determines what we are regulated to sell at electricity to consumers, which we don't control over. But those are the elements to look at. Um, how do we stimulate demand? What's the elasticity? Of possibly when the generation costs come down and end user tariffs come down, what's the last of people responding to that reduction in terms of usage for cooking and other alternative uses of electricity within their homes? I think those are the things we have to look at in terms of uh, to enable efficient use of electricity for economic development. Okay, Honorable Thomas, you're parting short. Yeah, um, the, I think what we need to do on top of the constant factors of inflation, of cost of, of, of diesel, and all that. We need to go back to the drawing board. One of the two big contributing factors. One, the, the return on investment we give to Meme is so huge. It's very big on our tariff. Yes, 20% return on investment. You can borrow at 1% and we pay you 20. That's unheard of in terms of dollar. Okay? Number two, uh, uh, the reduction of technical losses. How are we going to do it? I have told Celestine before. We have to take away the investment component from Umeme. We take it up as government, and Umeme as a good distributor concentrates on distribution, and then we get another agency, which most probably a government agency, where we can get cheap money, we invest into.
power distribution uh, into, 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 into the networks, okay? and ensure we reduce the technical losses. Because the moment we don't reduce technical losses, these tariffs will remain high. Okay. Dickens, you are parting shot. Yeah, I think uh, the thing that I would want to ask uh, Ugandans <coughs> is actually to be heard on the leaders. And what I would ask the MPs is to actually ensure that whoever makes a mistake, the ones that we have entrusted with power, <coughs> you go and negotiate a bad, uh, purchase agreement, you allow Mimi to actually declare a wrong process, you should actually be punished. The other uh, second point is actually the government of Uganda. You can extend the grid <coughs> to all these villages. And I tell you, it doesn't make economic sense. Exactly. If the government wants actually to ensure that the power can remain here in town, where there are industries, in the villages for the time being, do off grid where you can have solar panels on each household because that is the little power that they need, some lights, they are going to save a lot of money. It doesn't make sense to extend power to Chisoro and people, every household is consuming power of 5,000, 10,000, even if you are women. You are not going to make it economically sensible. It is not going to work. All right. So that's, those are the areas that we really thank need you. to work on. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Dickens Kamujisha, Executive Director, Africa Institute for Energy Governance. Thank you very much, Celestine Babungi, Managing Director of MEME. Thank you very much, Honorable Thomas Tayebo, a Member of Parliament for Rohinda North, and all of you who have been a part of this. As lucky in the last couple of weeks, I've traveled, traversed this country. I have seen at least a change that Ugandans are not just living in darkness. Solar is doing the uh, wonders for them. I was at my village in Chenjoju. I was in Chawente in, in Lira. I was in Namuria. I was in, in Kimengo in Masindi. I think when we move forward, uh, probably they will not even think about being on the grid. 